being to another. And so to a degree, I think we focus a lot on what we can control around transformation. And maybe we want to lean into a little bit more the spiritual dimensions of transformation that have nothing to do with the limits of our bodies, minds, or lives, where transformation happens in an instant and can be depended upon as you can depend on whether you see the sun covered by the clouds or not, you know the sun is there. Transformation is the same way, but we don't necessarily relate to it that way. So, of course, you know, I like to start with the gospel according to Miriam Webster. <laughs> Transformation is defined as an act, process, or instance of transforming or being transformed, which is not necessarily helpful. Because yet transform then is unknown to us. So Merriam-Webster, not being a lazy dictionary, tells us this about transform. To change in composition or structure. So we're not talking about like taking off this jacket that I'm wearing and putting on a new jacket. We literally are talking about the nature of the jacket no longer being cotton, but becoming, I don't know, platinum. That wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to have a platinum jacket. <laughs> to change the outward form or appearance of. To change in character or condition. To subject to mathematical transformation. To cause as a cell to undergo genetic transformation. So when we're talking about transformation, we are talking about a state change where one thing stops being a particular way and becomes something else, where you stop being a particular way and you become something else. Not tied extra not kind of like a new, you know, like a 2.0 version of the same thing. We're talking about a state change where you are no longer who you used to be and now you are this new thing. And that's a little challenging. Not for nothing. It's also, I think, important that we recognize the depth of what we're talking about because on one hand, it could be easier, if you will, to create a chicken that could swim than to have you transform enough to actually love your neighbor as yourself. Like, you know, we, we, there's all kinds of work being done now around genetics and um, I'm really hoping that they are successful with stem cells and all of that so that I don't have to have the surgery work done. <laughs> For those of you listening to the recording, I'm pointing at my face. <laughs> and that it's also maybe not, you know, shots of poison, but it's just a pill and automatically you just transform. <laughs> like, there's a pill for five years off, 10 years off, 20 years off, <laughs> and you just take a pill. But it really might be easier to try and create a two-headed chicken than to actually have people love their neighbors, all of your neighbors, as yourself. By merit of your own word, not a word that was written 2,000 years ago. So I like to talk about the myth of things. And the first myth that I'd like to talk about is that transformation occurs one time about the same thing. And I'll fast forward to the end of this section by saying, do you ever find yourself saying, I thought I was finished with this. I thought I had dealt with this. I thought it was done. What's wrong with me? 
There's nothing wrong with you. You're just a human being having a spiritual experience and transformation leads to transformation. See, transformation is not about you feeling good or better. That's not what transformation is for. Transformation is to take you from one state of being to another one. And so all of the things that were associated with that first state of being are no longer going to be sufficient for this new state of being. I had this happen to me um, probably about a little over 10 years ago. I lost 25 pounds and started exercising, went down a size, like, you know, jumping up and down in the, tri in the fitting room, like that whole thing. And I know you're asking yourself now, what happened? <laughs> I'm sure none of you would be rude enough to actually say it out loud. <laughs> but what happened was I transformed again. Back to the fat. <laughs> it was just another moment of transformation. Because that first moment of transformation, I didn't have the capacity to hold it and to maintain it. And so then I transformed again. Now I'm looking for another transformation, <laughs> going the other way, back in the other direction. But we tend to sometimes think about transformation as like a one-time thing, like you go to have your car serviced. Like, I'm going to go get transformed, and then I'm going to live the rest of my life powerfully, and everything's going to be great. And I'm never going to ever feel bad about anything again. And it's childish. It's kind of like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's childish. It's wishful thinking. It's not spiritual practice. So... When we transform something, it's kind of like when you're decorating your house or maybe redecorating your house. Like you paint and then all of the furniture looks awful. Then you replace all the furniture and the rugs are <laughs> ghastly. You take up the rugs and the floor is atrocious. So you redo the floor, you buy new rugs, and then every time you walk into your house, you say, oh my God, we got to paint the outside of the house. <laughs> and then you paint the outside of the house and all of the shrubbery around the house is garbage. <laughs> transformation leads to transformation and leads you to another transformation and another transformation. See, I think that we have these iconic archetype transformations. We have Jesus on the cross. We have the Buddha seeking enlightenment, lead, literally about to enter into the realm of nothingness and turning back to the world to teach others about the path. We have Muhammad, who is, the, who is a man who cannot read or write and is somehow imbued by the divine to write the Quran, having not the capacity to read and write. So we have kind of like these big state transformations, but we don't regard transformation in our daily life. So if kind of like if you're not feeling, you know, like prints in your hand and on two pieces of wood, you don't feel like transformation is possible. We're going to bring it down a little bit and actually have the archetype of transformation just live in our daily lives the way everything else does because it's not different. The second myth I'd like to talk about is that those spiritual teachers and the prophets, um, all of the examples that we have, all of the principles that we have around transformation, all of that is better than us. It's kind of like, wow, look at them, they're transformed, oh my God. They're so amazing, look at her, look at him. It's all over there, outside of ourselves. Transformation is for other people. They do it better than I do. Sound familiar? Because how would it be if we just acknowledged that 
that's a person living their life. And even if it looks transformational, they've still got their own transformations that are going to be ongoing in their lives. But we don't hold it that way. We for, and we forget how difficult transformation is. Because I'm going to just say that everyone in this room has had at least one moment in your life of transformation where literally something happened and you went from one way of being to another. And then life was just very different from that moment going forward. Each of us has at least had that one moment. But we forget when we're on the other side celebrating that transformation that it, was all, it almost killed you to get to that transformation. It like near to destroy you from the inside out. And we don't remember Sometimes because it's painful to remember, but also because we just forget. And then when the opportunity of transformation comes up again, it doesn't look like transformation. It looks like a problem. It looks like some insufficiency inside of us. Something that we should be better at. We should be, should be, should be. If I had a dollar for every time I said should be or was in a subway car or a house of worship with people who said should be. We had to get a bigger house. <laughs> but we operate like all of these things just kind of like happen arbitrarily or even your transformation does, and it takes work. That, that whole metaphor of the, the, the butterfly coming out of the chrysalis, the process of the butterfly coming out of the chrysalis literally is so, if we were to assign pain to it, it would be like pulling you through the keyhole of a door. But the process of pulling you through that keyhole actually strengthens your wings. It strengthens your very construction such that when you come out of the chrysalis, you are able to fly. Butterflies die when people go in and try and mess with that process. Because if the, if the butterfly doesn't push its way out, pull its way out, it doesn't have the strength in its wings to fly, and it just ends up dying on the ground. Transformation is difficult, and it's not that others are doing it better. They may just be remembering more that it's part of the natural process of life. And something about those figures that I mentioned, whether it's the Buddha or Jesus or Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, all of them surrendered something for their transformation. And... It's kind of like, you know, there's that, because I watch way too much television my whole life, even to this day. And one of my favorite lines from TV, and I think it was only in the television show of fame, was when Debbie Allen is telling the students that you want fame, fame costs. And right here is where you start paying in sweat. You want transformation, transformation costs. And right here is where you start paying in surrender. In giving up that which no longer works. In surrendering, in giving away, in letting go of that which is holding you in the place that is plaguing you. That makes it difficult to get out of the bed every day. When I told um, yesterday... Um, was the commencement graduation ceremony for One Spirit Interfaith Seminary. And I'm a dean at One Spirit. And I told a couple of my colleagues that I was going to be coming here. And they know that I've been speaking here for years. And they said, well, are you going to be talking about um, Anthony Bourdain? Will, will you be able to speak about Kate Spade? How is that in your spirit right now? And it was very interesting because I didn't know either one of them. 
I knew them as the personality that they were to the world. So I don't have a personal feeling about them. But what I do feel is that no one is safe from mental illness. We're all subject to it. And if their lives could be for a blessing, it might be that we would look more thoughtfully and carefully at the presence of mental illness in our lives and in the lives of the people around us, in the communities around us, and provide compassion for ourselves and for others. We had a student who actually did a worship service as part of her preparing for ministry on Mental Health Awareness Day, on that Sunday. And the information that she provided let us all know that there was no one who was not directly impacted in one way or another from mental illness. No one. And it may take a little time to sort it out, but we're all in this together. And so if anything, I just pray that their lives would illuminate the need for us to address these topics more head on and to take it back to the theme of the day, to not think that transformation didn't happen in their lives, that they didn't experience that, because likely they did, they're human beings, we all experience transformation. But there was something that so saddened that life didn't seem worth living. And that's something for us to be mindful of. The third and final myth is that one day, someday, I'll be transformed. One day, someday, it'll all come together. And I will either float away or dissolve into nothingness or just sit on my couch and binge on Netflix without guilt. <laughs> Whatever that looks like for you. But one day, you'll be transformed and everything will be right. One day is today. Someday is today. There really is no need to delay your own transformation. And we are living in a time, which is a very special time because I know that the administration and all of these things have been very challenging for any number of people, but the profound opportunity for transformation has never been more present in the last maybe 60 years than it is today. Because for everything that we can look at and point at in society that we say shouldn't be that way, should be different, each of those are an opportunity for us to bring transformation to a world that is in need of love like never before. And I mean the entire planet. There is no place on this planet where transformation is not needed. And more importantly, where it's not wanted. Because the people in need of transformation need us to transform so that we could be of sacred service to them because they don't have the strength to do it. They really are dealing with the daily plight of existence. Like which of my children will eat today? Will the bomb finally fall or will the rocket finally fall not just around the house but in the house? Is this the day that the water will literally dry up and the support aid 
won't be able to get the truck in. We are, we are long past DEPCOM 27 or whatever number it is. We are at the point where, if you will, your transformation is no longer just personal to you, but the planet needs it. We need each and every one of us to look and see what is the transformation that we want in our lives. And then, and I do not mean to, I don't mean to, to diminish this or to make it sound easy because I know that it's not, but when you've identified that thing or that area of your life to bring transformation to, that's when you align yourself with the great mystery. That's when you align yourself with God. Because God is already here. God is omnipresent. God is all and all. And we are all and all and omnipresent. The mind and character of God is the mind and character of us. And so once we identify that thing in partnership with the divine, we ask for it to be transformed. Where I did find a reference around transformation was in A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson and the, and the work within A Course in Miracles. And she says this, forgiveness is the key to inner peace because it is the mental technique by which our thoughts are transformed from fear to love. So if we're looking for our own transformation, in order to usher in that transformation, you're going to need to do two things. One, you're going to look, need to look and see who or what do you need to forgive in that area that you want to bring transformation. Because likely, that state of unforgiveness and blame and shame and anger and fear is what prevents the transformation from happening on its own. And then the second thing, and probably equal to the first, is you have to speak the transformation. You have to say, out of your mouth, I say today, I speak this word, that from this day forward, I am, and then continue. Not I will be, not I'll try to be, not I'll do my best, because that's language for people who are not acquainted with spiritual power. the two most powerful words in the universe, I am. And when you follow that with anything, it is. So for us to address what there is to address for ourselves, but for the community, for the nation, and for the world, it is time for you to forgive and it is time for you to speak and to honor the transformation that is happening and will happen moment by moment in your life and to give that, the results of that, give it as a gift. Because everybody in the world is not in this, in this building. The people in your life are not in this building. The people you need to forgive are not in this building. Whatever you take from your transformation, whatever your, your dividend is from your transformation, share it. Don't let it be this secret thing that you have, but give it away. God bless you. Thank you so much. <laughs>